Good evening everybody and welcome. Welcome to those in the room here and welcome to those viewing us live or recording later online. Uh, we're pleased to welcome Tony Tucker this evening who is going to talk to us about uh, some unusual um, things that have happened in his career and with some <coughs> anecdotes and so on. And so please welcome Tony Tucker. <laughs> Just, just a little bit of background, um, I was trained, I did a seven year apprenticeship as a yacht designer and surveyor under my father. My father was a person called Robert Tucker, some of you may be old enough to remember silhouettes, debutantes, caprices, Matildas, Corribees and such like. Um, and so for the last that number of years I have been designing and uh, I also survey all sorts of materials. Uh, if you like, my specialist materials, in some respects, are wood and concrete. And people laugh at that one, but it's taken me to, you know, to Jamaica, Croatia, Canaries, Scandinavia, and such like. And one of those will come up a bit later. Um, so yes, and uh, I'm known in the industry for doing things that are, what should we say, slightly unusual. So not everything. So just to start off with a bit of background. Well, that's me on the left. Uh, when I was 12 years old. Recognised you. Good. <laughs> um, they were the trophies we won. Uh, we sell Yachting World Cadets. If anybody can remember what they are, but they are still the major training class yeah. for children uh, at competitive level. In fact, you can see a cadet there. Yeah. Uh, we won the World Championships in 1963. Um, my helmsman there was Mike Harrison who became a very successful East Coast racing skipper, mm -hmm. as well as a bit as uh, a solicitor. Just to give you something more normal, should we say? Uh, there we go. Back in the 80s, I developed a new method of plating round build vessels, steel vessels, so that originally, um, to do a good round build boat, you needed a skilled person who could roll and wheel a uh, plate. So I developed this transverse system so that a good fabricator, fabricator boat builder, could actually build a nice shape, round build, sailing yacht. And the first, that one is actually a 45 footer. It went to uh, the Caribbean. When I asked him, I know he said, you're going to go to the Pacific. I said, you're, are you coming back? He said, no, the idea is to go. I want to come back. <laughs> but the first ever boat built by that method is this one. And she is you know, nearly 34 feet long. And that's me with uh, proper colour hair uh, sitting there. And in fact, the guy steering, uh, whose name I must admit I've completely forgotten, but he was the editor of Practical Boat Owner at the time. But I designed this boat, uh, and the owners, that's the owner's knees, um, because he wanted to go to the Caribbean. Mm. So we actually sailed this boat to the Caribbean, and back, twice. He then sold it, and the second owners bought it, they did a sabbatical, and they took it to the Red Sea for a year. Third oh. so owner thought, well, yeah, okay, fine, but he took it all the way around the world. Oh. She's now sitting in Hartlepool Marina. <laughs> Yes, yeah, ask questions any time you like. Where did you do the crossing? From, Sorry? Down on the Caribbean, where did you do the crossing from to? Uh, I'm not absolutely certain, but south, Buttermelt, Canaries and across. Canaries, okay. Yeah. A lot of people down the tendency to do Canaries, Madeira, and then Madeira is the short leg uh, across. So, people were talking about wheels earlier. Um, this is a, a passenger boat, believe it or not. Sorry about the funny angle. Uh, it's the only way I could try and get it in. You'll notice it's in a cave. Yeah. Mm. Um, now, these boats are actually now 20 years old. And I know that because uh, I had a phone call just before Christmas. These are in the Blue John mines up in Derbyshire. There's two of them. Between the two of them, they carry 55,000 passengers per annum. They sink occasionally because the um, uh, <laughs> cave floods, so there's not much you can do about it, and they can't turn around. So they start, they go, and they come back. 
Um, and I know how old they are because the guy who owns uh, the, the caves rang me up before Christmas and said, I'm 25, 20 years old. We cannot maintain them because they're down in the caves. They can't get them out. You know, getting them out is a major operation. Um, and of course, the atmosphere down there is totally damp, so they can't get them up. Uh, can we have another two, please? Huh. And I said, do you have uh, exactly the same? He said, yeah, just with a few tweaks. So I must have done something like that. But they have a wheel on each corner there. And how would you get them down there in the first place? Okay, they have to go down the staircase. The staircase has a central um, railing. The staircase is 144 steps. But they have to take the central railing out, which is a major operation, and then they can be winched down and winched back up again. Wow. So um, the first new one is ready for delivery probably in about three to four weeks' time. So, you won't be able to keep Yes, yes. But when I, uh, again, when I first designed them, I went up there and asked, well, what are the problems? So you'll notice it's got a side deck and a left combing. That's because on their old boats, they didn't have a side deck. And when you're in these boats, you have a tendency to sit there and do this. Which meant you then got your arm scraped up and down the uh, rocks. Rocks, exactly. <laughs> and so that was one. The other thing, this grid down the middle, I put a box keel in. So that all the water that came off the cave top, cave ceiling, would drain down into there and it pumped out. And they're powered by little electric outboards. <clears throat> Wheels are useful. Sorry? The wheels are going, because they're going through caves, yeah. the wheels allow it to rotate, go through yeah. the cave. Which caves are they again? The wheels on each corner. No, no, which caves again? The Blue John Mines. Blue John Mines. In, in Derbyshire. Yeah. Thank you. I was asked to do, would you design the um, stability and anchoring for a five metre high inflatable hooker duck? <laughs> so you instantly think, <laughs> Is this guy having a laugh? <laughs> but actually, you then do it. <laughs> this is a permanent art installation. If you come out of Canary Wharf, Elizabeth Line, and turn right, it's there. So, as I say, it's not exactly the normal thing you would come across. Can you go back to the previous slide? Please. Please. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, but our company Emblem is a duck. <laughs> there we go. But as I say, so how does it anchor? anchor? How does it anchor? Mm. It's all dependent. Okay, so what we've got is we've got this steel disc which is there. So we have fixed, four fixed connections between the steel disc. So that steel disc <coughs> gives it our stability and also means it doesn't try and you know, um, collapse on itself. So then we've got four anchors there, and the boys are there so that, because in the same docks, there are, are boats running around which are um, jacuzzis and barbecue boats. <laughs> They're being driven by anybody who wants to pay the money. Why okay. is it there? Sorry? Why, why did they okay. want it? Because the uh, what was a row of shops is now basically uh, a set of gamings like you see gaming arcades in um, <coughs> fairs and places like that. Okay. So their name is Fair Game, and they built this game, and this was a um, a sculpture. So those red boys are the actual the, the holding. Yeah, they're to make sure that the. Um, Barbecue boats and such like, you know, keep away from it. <coughs> and the red boys, yes, they are the actual anchors underneath there. This is Richmond Pier. Anybody know Richmond Pier? Mm -hmm. uh, this is Richmond Pier, as you see, July 2019. Now, Richmond Pier actually has an interesting history um, because most Thames <laughs> piers are pontoons, I'm sure you know that. Richmond Pier, it's about 100 feet long, was originally built in 1951 for the Festival of Britain. And it was to hold an orchestra of Battersea. And it actually, at the end, had two wings that did that for this orchestra. 
The wings had gone years ago, but all the kit was still inside it, or was still inside it at this point. We took it to Chatham Dockyard. Anybody been in Chatham Dockyard yeah. recently? Well, this is the yeah. working part of Chatham Dockyard. Um, and I always chuckle when I go <coughs> to Chatham Dockyard, partly because my father uh, signed on as a shipwright in 1939 in Chatham Dockyard. My grandfather was an electrician in Chatham Dockyard, and so on. Mm -hmm. And then we did this with it. Okay, that is the same pier. <laughs> and um, so my job is to act as consultant, if you like. It's a commercial kitchen. So this area underneath there is commercial kitchen. Uh, these are storage areas. We've got freezers and everything else in there. But my, my job also was to ballast it to the right level. Mm. Because where you see all those pink umbrellas, they're on a college barge, which is also a restaurant. And we'll come on to what a college barge is in a minute. But the uh, person or the organisation that runs this is an organisation called Daisy Green. And she has been uh, basically working for about a year, if that. I was taking 400 cups a day. Can we have another one, please? So we're actually doing another one in Chatham Dockyard as we speak. Not as big as that, though. Well, that's Richmond uh, here, and we'll come back to that in a minute. But a college barge, anybody know what a college barge is? How do you ballast it? Sorry? How do you ballast it? Concrete. So not water. No, no. Well, we'll fix ballast. Because we also have a problem uh, when they do the draw off of the river this end will ground so we have to be very careful as far as that's concerned but concrete will protect the inside of the steel it's going to have to repair the steel no you don't paint the inside of the steel you actually paint it in concrete if you take big ships big ships water tanks are cement washed because it's odorless tasteless and protects the inside of the steel tank so and that's been done for decades basically wow. so now we're using concrete I mean there's about 50 tons of ballast in this thing. <laughs> yeah. but the college barge the college barge they were built roughly between 1880 and 1930 Oxford colleges and they were floating clubhouses and bars and viewing platforms they are obviously wood most of them were built out of double diagonal do you all know what double diagonal planking is mm -hmm. well basically it's that yeah. Two, at least two layers of planking riveted together, okay? And you can imagine after this length of time, um, they are in, in rather a bad state. <coughs> so that's what a college barge actually looks like. Well, the difference is that that one is Jesus College Barge. This one is actually New College Barge. But I used it because uh, that's uh, in, on the slipway at Pie Island. I had to survey it. Um, and just to, you can see there the wooden part of the original boat. And this one, yeah, that is the original top. But it's in this steel tray. So many of them are in these steel trays. Mm. And you end up having to go, as a surveyor, you have to go between the steel tray and the wooden boat. What? Okay, and so when I did that, I got another surveyor to come with me, because when you've got the best part of 80 feet of boat, and you've only got one entrance, it's <coughs> nice to have the security of somebody else, yeah, someone else underneath there. Yeah. there. <laughs> but they also know about wooden boats, they also know about steel vessels, so um, it was good to, to get rather long. And, uh, but that's what you've got underneath it. So this bit up here is what is supporting the old college barge, and you can see the old steel tray. And in fact, when you get to the forward end of this, these cross members, they're steel cross members, which you can't see on this picture unfortunately, but actually most of them didn't exist. <laughs> so in order to actually preserve the barge on top, we would have had to support the barge and chop first, and then chop the boat off from underneath it, and then rebuild a new platform on uh, the floor of the boat. 
Right, this was a funny project we did in the early 1970s. Anyone guess the river? And? <laughs> I think the tree would be like this. Yeah. Is that amazing? No, I don't know. Closer to the <laughs> uh, wrong side of the ocean. Amazon. Well done, that person at the back there. The Amazon is correct. Amazon. So this actually we designed as a, it's a doctor's and dentist surgery, which yeah. services about 3,000 square miles of the upper Amazon basin for the Christian Brethren Missionary Society. <coughs> that's what it is. It's a doctor's and dentist surgery. It was built uh, in Daventry. Oh, Heraclitus. Now, this is one of the most ugly boats I, I come across. Um, I mentioned her. She's built out of concrete. She was built in ferrous cement in 1974 in Southern California. And originally, my client for this boat, and I've been on this project for 10 years, um, was in Santa Fe. So, we've actually completely rebuilt this vessel. But one of the reasons it would have been cheaper to have actually built a new one, uh, and especially as this one has inherent problems. But she was very badly built uh, in 1974. Um, and when I came across her, or when I was asked to survey her 10 years ago, we ended up with only about 25% of the boat left. But that has been rebuilt. She's about 75 feet long. But being a badly built boat, she has circumnavigated twice. She has been up the Amazon, she's been to the Antarctic, she's a research vessel. Um, as such, they, because of her history and people who know about the vessel, they wanted to rebuild it. I think, and if anybody's ever seen ferrous cement, mm -hmm. that is ferrous cement. She is about 28 millimeters thick. But, uh, you know, the original 10, 12 millimeter steel reinforcing bars were down to sewing needle thickness because of the way they built it in the first place. But uh, interesting project in what they do. She has an inherent problem. Um, old sailing vessels, galleons and things like that, were designed on what was known as the cod's head and mackerel tail principle. And what that means is the cod heads is like that, the mackerel tail is like that. This meant that your centre of gravity was forward and your centre of drag aft. And that's important, because if I take a dart, hold it by the point and drop it, the weight and point hit the floor first and the drag is behind you. If it's the other end, you notice the dart has turned round its own accord. If you've ever had a boat which has that wrong, you are literally steering it like this all the time, depending which way the bow decides to go off. Uh, and she has that, yet she still, she has that problem. And I've taken a boat from here, uh, from Limehouse Basin to Santa Mary in France, 14 hours on the wheel with that exact problem. Um, it wasn't my design. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so she has that problem and we couldn't, even though we rebuilt her, um, she's still being fitted out now. Um, in, she's in a place called Roses, which is northeast Spain, just where the Pyrenees uh, tumble down into the Mediterranean. But uh, if nobody's ever seen concrete, that's a um, concrete piece. Uh, so you've got the original material here. This is the new mesh that we've added, and then that is, was then watered. This is dated 2014. I surveyed this boat um, 2014 at Hurley. Does anybody know what she is? Chris Reaver. She's not a Chris Craft, she is a Reaver. And there's a big difference between the two. She's a Reaver at Coral. Mm. Mm. I was rushed out to a place just south of Alicante um, in November. She'd been in a road <laughs> accident. And yeah, sorry about the angle of the picture. Um, but she'd been hit by a truck. She was in a lay-by. She'd been hit by a truck. So I'm sure his um, insurance company is not very happy with him. But this is uh, these are the romantic places we get to survey. 
So this was a police compound uh, in a town an hour and a half south of Alicante Airport. And all this travel sounds very romantic, but I left my house at three o'clock in the morning. I got back to my house at 2.30 in the morning. I spent most of that time in Alicante Airport. I spent about two and a half hours on the metal. And the repairs are likely to cost about £180,000. But in pristine condition, these vessels are worth three quarters of a million now. And they've gone up from about 500,000 five years ago to three quarters of a million now. <laughs> this is Bird Boy, which is a statue underneath the cable car. Literally underneath the cable car across the Thames. Okay, she's in the dock. Um, and I was brought in because somebody had decided to dive in and swim out and climb aboard it. It nearly turned over and clocked them on the head, and yes, it is a bronze statue. So I was asked to look at the stability, and which is why we've got whoops, which is why we've got this much bigger platform. All they were going to do was add ballast. Actually, with something that is vertical sided, adding ballast makes it less stable. I can show you the maths at some stage if you ever want. It's not quite simple, but it becomes less stable. And no, that was not the right answer, so we ended up making a bigger platform. And this then followed on. This was from Kingston University. This is something called line art. There is a line art, so you can follow down the Thames, and there's different art gentleman there obviously knows about yeah, it. Walk it. It's a you walked it. You walked it. It's a lovely uh, route. Um, so there is this line art that you can follow down the Thames, and this is one of the exhibits mm -hmm. on that circuit. <coughs> but this then, uh, this was uh, Kingston University got in touch with me first of all, <coughs> and that led on to the next job they gave me was how many dancing girls can we get on a wide beam boat? <laughs> on the roof of a wide beam boat for an art installation. So, as I say, these things don't are, are not the normal things that you come across. And yes, we had the dancing girls there, they were fully dressed up, right? Um, but I think we had 12 up there because we also had scenery and other things for this art installation. This was a valuation job. <laughs> And now the car's a lot parked under the evening. Um, a few years ago, I was asked to go up to Middlesbrough. I work occasionally with a company in a, a village called Bovingdon, which is just near Hemel Hempstead. Yeah. They are plant and agricultural machining values and auctioneers. That's how they style themselves. They do a moderate amount in the aviation world as well. And uh, you know, if it's anything serious, I am their marine department. So if you've done anything for evaluation of a few narrowboats, racing yachts to uh, this one, and I also did another one, which will come up shortly. Um, but yes, she is a six leg jack up. Interesting thing, she was Chinese built. <coughs> and the crane. So, how heavy is that generator on top of that pencil you see sticking out of the water? Any ideas? Fifteen hundred kilos. Sorry. Fifteen hundred kilos. That's what I'm Yeah, three hundred and sixty tons is the normal weight of a, about a five megawatt generator. Each blade you see out there weighs five tons each of carbon fiber. So <laughs> that crane can lift four hundred tons at quite a large radius in order to be able to lift the pencil onto the base and to put the generator on the top and to put the various blades onto the uh, generator. But, uh, I was worried when we were doing this job, um, I was most worried that we were going to get a number of people who said, well, because it was the parent company that went into liquidation as this tied up. It was brand new. So doing valuation on something like this, because it, at the time it was the only, it was the first ever purpose-built wind farm erection vessel. All the others have been modifications of other vessels. So we had no comparables to go on, which is what you need as a, a, a valuer. And so we, I spent 29 hours, and there was two other people doing the valuation work with me, but they were looking at management and various other 
political parts of the whole system. But yeah, we um, we put on, we were holding the hands of a small chartered accountant called Deloitte's. Um, and we put our report into them on a Saturday morning. The bids were open Monday morning. And within £250,000 of our figure went into the bank Wednesday morning. So we didn't do too bad a job. Very good. Everybody was very pleased about that. And how much did it sell for? I haven't got a clue I forgot. I think I think that we valued it something between eighteen and nineteen million. Um, she originally cost about at that time something in the region of twenty-three million. <coughs> she needed about another five million spent on her at the time, which would then make her what we describe as a one-stop shop, so that she could actually um, excavate the seabed, put the base in then put the mast on top, put the generator on top, fix the blades. She also had an ROV on board that could literally, they stick it in the water, you know, you put the wires in and connect it up the wires and to this one, that one, and take the shot. Quite fantastic bits of kit. I'm back to Richmond Pier. One of the funniest survey jobs you do is uh, the Cornish gigs. Mm. And this, uh, these arches, are literally next door on this Richmond Pier, and the arches are on the shore side beside Richmond Pier. And the next arch is Mark, whose surname, I'm sorry I've forgotten, but he was the man who built Gloriana. Mm -hmm. and, and if you ever want to, if you ever got a couple of hours to spare and want to chat, <coughs> it's very good. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, so. We do sometimes, you do get sometimes get very small boats to survey. They're not all big things. And this was another valuation. This one took me a year. Um, this is a work platform, unpowered, so it's towed by tug everywhere. Top of that mast is 110 feet above the deck. Fantastic view of Port Glasgow uh, if you get up there. You've got accommodation here in basically containers for 100 people. Their average container costs about £4,000. Each one of these containers costs about £100,000, but it's plug and play. So that you've got water, electricity, sewage, and air conditioning for two cabins and a full container. But she was the um, work platform that raised the cost of Concordia. You may remember the line that decided to go a little bit too close to the coast. And that's the um, view from the top of the mast. Yes, she's a sail training vessel. Uh, the funny thing about this one was <coughs> that this was I had this was a valuation I was doing in Gothenburg, but it was owned by a Swedish evangelical organisation, being sold to a British evangelical organization. So being on board was quite interesting for a little while. But these are the British Evangelical Organization which is based as you'd expect in Harpenden. And those are people who close to the sea, yeah. Sorry? Very close to the sea. It is, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> but when you work on these projects, you get uh, you know, I went out there, I think with two South Africans, I was picked up uh, at the airport by he, was, he told me he was a qualified doctor, but looked as if he should have been in short trousers. Um, and I think he was Russian. You meet people from all over the world and you work with these people from all over the world. Now going back to Heraclitus. Heraclitus is known worldwide in its field um, and they've done a lot of eco projects. But they, the, the people who come and work on it are volunteers, but again, you're working with people from all over the place. You know? There's even one guy I had, I, you know, well, talked about coincidences in the marine business. One of them, after several times of me visiting there, said, came up to me and said, Did I serve our boat at Sarsons Vinegar 30 years ago? Hmm. I said, Yeah, that was me. He said, I worked on that one as well. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. uh, the British organisation, when uh, one of the charities, Red Cross, 
uh, children's charities do a big project in, in Africa or India or somewhere, then the people who actually volunteer to go out there and do that work are trained by these charities. And that's the major function. That's Charing Cross Pier. The old Charing Cross Pier. <coughs> I've served Hayden Hill, I've done bits and pieces on her um, uh, over the years, I think three or four times. And uh, she had a fire some years ago. She's actually, or she was, she no longer is, but she was privately owned. But she had a fire which damaged a lot of this top and most of the uh, buildings on the top here. She was built in about 1920, something like that, 1925. Um, but this canopy, I noticed, did not burn. Even though the buildings below were destroyed, only the seams had come unglued. <coughs> and I'll show you why that was interesting later. But that was in Docklands. Um, as I say, strange things one has to go and look at, value or do various bits of work. It nearly ended up in court, but we didn't get that far. Floating houses. I get involved in these, partly because of these. So these are pontoons, which are made out of laminated concrete. Uh, laminated concrete was a system developed in, in uh, Florida, many, many years back in the 70s. And that pattern has passed down to two people in this country. One of those in Leeds, and the other is currently standing in this room. Um, so these are <coughs> thin shell, hollow pontoons, and that house is about 3,000 square feet, just to give you an idea. Uh, she's quite a large house and she's at Tags Island. Can you get inside those pontoons? Yeah. Yeah, they, they are, they make a fantastic wine stand. <laughs> so down there, it's the same all year round. I do go aboard one of them quite regularly. And in fact, I was, um, during this last week, I was opposite this one. Uh, I was doing a valuation. Uh, Tags Island has a lagoon it's in the middle. Tags, isn't it? Tags yeah. Island, yes, Hampton Court. Yeah. Um, just above Hampton Court. Tags Island has a lagoon in the middle. And that lagoon contains 20 floating houses. They're all single story. Um, on five and a half pontoons, and they're done in 1984. Mm. Um, so, and for some reason, I seem to be the favoured surveyor who goes through these pontoons. We can't take them out of the water. They can't get them out from the lagoon. And there's no longer anywhere to actually dry them out these days. So, I'm the favoured surveyor to go through these things. And so, the one I was valuing, which had been completely rebuilt, was dead opposite this one. So, and yeah, we're very happy on it, I'm pleased to see. Mm, nice. Now, the other, the, a couple of weeks ago, um, I said, oh, no, I couldn't go to the, the meeting. Uh, a film that just north of Leighton Buzzard is an organisation called Marine Department. And they are involved in films. Okay, so they do marine work, they do all sorts of stuff for films. So they've, they've got a number of boats there which they want me to code, um, but currently I can't code them because they're out in Turkey on a film. But so I was dispatched, you know, uh, could you go to um, Kiel? No, next week, not the week after, next week. Um, so this was beginning of January. So I went out to Kiel to examine this boat. I'm not sure if the next one yet. To see if you can crane it. <coughs> now, to give you the now, this boat was a Brixham trawler. So she was built as a sailing trawler 130 years ago. Wow. So you can imagine that looking at this and thinking, doing this with it, <laughs> when they're held together by iron nails which we are, there in our terminology, they're known as dumps. They're square iron nails. But they're nailed into oak. Now, you may not know, but oak is a highly acidic timber. Mm. So when you see, often see the old fishing boats, mm. and you see the superstructure of the wheelhouse, and you see it's black. That is because metal fastenings, iron fastenings, or iron-based fastenings, have been used, and the iron has 
corroded away, uh, that has rotted the tube. So we have two possible problems there. Uh, so we actually had to come up with a plan of how she could be craned. So she was craned onto this ship. She is currently en route to Turkey, where she'll be used for a couple of months for filming, and she'll be craned back on the ship and back to the Baltic. As I say, it's, it's, you know, it's not the run of the mill and stuff. Is it a regular ship, Balkaro? Sorry? A regular ship, Balkaro? Oh, no, the vessel she's on is owned by an organization called Peters and May. Peters and May are based in Southampton, and they have specialist ships which transport boats around the world. But one other thing, they have this specialist fleet. So, remember there was a, um, well, 10 years back or so, there was a hurricane uh, on one of the uh, West Indian islands, which flattened it, and 4,000 boats were damaged. So it's a cake. It may well have been, I can't remember, yeah. Mm. But I think it was before that one, actually. Okay. But there was um, 4,000 boats there. And of course, the West Indies can't cope with 4,000 damaged boats. Mm -hmm. So the insurance companies actually chartered a number of these types of vessels out to the West Indies, put the boats on them, and then they basically dropped them off in North America, Europe, Britain, all over the place for um, repair. In fact, one of my own designs was out there, was knocked over. And so that was brought back, uh, brought back, took, taken back up to Liverpool, uh, where um, it was repaired. <laughs> oh, yes. So when it went into the water, it was fine. Which? That last one. When you dropped it it's, back in the water, it was all right. It's on the ship now. No, oh, we don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It is currently. Okay. Yeah. It's got through this first part. <laughs> so, uh, and I'm pleased to say, <laughs> according, to, according to the <laughs> captain of the owner of this vessel, who is German, um, and she has a lovely name. She's called Ethel von Brixen. <laughs> <laughs> lovely name, I think. Um, but no, she is still on the ship. Okay. Right. So we shall see. Well, she sense? is being sprayed with salt water on a regular basis to make sure she keeps up the size and everything keeps it in shape. The marine department guy out there did ring me the other day and say, I'm thinking of getting lots of buoyancy bags that I could put around just in case. And I said, yeah, I would also <coughs> suggest sheets of tarpaulin so that if she is leaking through a number of seams, you can just get those sucked, put them down the side and they'll get sucked in. Oh, this is not far from where we are now. No. That's Thomas's dock, which I'm involved with. And the people who own that also own the Battersea Barge. Now these are venues. Battersea Barge is a theatre. And I did the new superstructure for her. Um, but Thomas is, because the flow on the Thames has changed, its deposition of silt has changed. And this actually sits down on blocks. So it doesn't sit on the camp shed, it doesn't sit on the beach, she sits on the block. But the beach in some areas has built up from one location only, that her bottom is now seriously distorted. And come next year, we shall have her in the dock and replace her bottom. It's not, as I say, these boats were built from the 1930s, they're riveted, so they're that bit more difficult to do. We have problems with the Battersea barge, with the clippers. Because when they built the new super sewer at Battersea, they built an access down. Mm -hmm. And they built it out into the Thames, as they've done a number of them. So this has changed the tidal pattern and the way the wave pattern comes in. So she goes up and down on piles, one pile at each end. And the sleeves are basically industrial rubber going up and down these piles. But because of the way the waves are now coming in, that industrial rubber is literally disintegrated in six months. It is that, whereas before, you know, it lasted decades. Mm -hmm. The question is, when that goes up and down, mm -hmm. with the, the silt that's coming in from the, 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 the side of the bank, it's yep. changing all the time. Yep. And you said that sits on like a cradle, a block. Yeah. 
but the real silk coming in is this very... It really comes into one particular yeah. gap between two of the box. Have you worked out a way yet of creating something that can always have that boat? Because all the boats of the Thames, when it sits on the silks, you see them eventually, they, they, they twist over. Yeah. Because the silk comes up the side with it all yeah. away from yeah. where you're talking about. That's right. So have you worked out a way yet where you can actually most people put ties or bits of piece underneath them. Is there a special way that you found it? No, because the, right? the actual, if that's the camp shedding, she's on blocks that high. Right. And the silk is actually coming up into yes. that. Just that but at the moment, we are moving in a way, or they're moving in a way, uh, manually with a digger. And I've also suggested they might use um, ultra high pressure water. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. I'm not sure what's allowed. <laughs> It's all fresh water anyway. So once you're above London Bridge, it's actually fresh, according to the PLA. Okay. Mm -hmm. Going back to um, uh, Charing Cross Pier, and, and the fact that the fabric didn't burn. This is the new London floating church. Now the original concept was done by architects, I did the rest. So, you know, people know the cell maker Jekylls? Mm -hmm. So I got Chris Jekyll involved, I've known three generations of Jekylls, <coughs> to do this section. And obviously that roof lifts, so it has to be rock proof, vermin proof, uh, hopefully you know, damage proof, and fireproof, because this is a public building. Okay, and you can see where it is, it's near, near the park, the Olympic Park. But yes, her roof weighs 1.7 tons. The amount of fabric weighs in excess of one ton. And those lights are actually in the fabric. Wow. They're not just in the boat, they're in the fabric. Mm -hmm. But we did it in such that each of those sections is removable. So that if somebody did come along and say, there's something unpleasant, um, we could actually change a section. Mm -hmm. And when the, when the uh, architects came up with the, when I first met the eye, I said, well, we're going to have to have poles down the inside. He said, what? Well, you can't do that. Yeah. I said, well, you've got one and a half tons of guillotine there. If it comes down, the wind goes, goes blows it in, it's going to just drop it in pieces. Ooh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, don't think of that. <clears throat> but, um, so we, we came up with that idea. And uh, <coughs> the London diocese were using this vessel as an interim vessel. The funny thing is that I designed that 25 years ago. It's a classroom, it's all electric, it's electric powered. Uh, and it was designed, and I did have all the tunnels surveyed, so I didn't need to put wheels on the roof, which is what British waterways had to do on their vessel because we have these. But she has a big forward cockpit um, and you can see out through the windows in that nice slope of Rapa Carlin. But yeah, it was a floating classroom by day. It could be used as a function point by night and we could recharge it in about eight hours. Mm -hmm. So there are three tons of batteries on it, uh, all two volt cells. <coughs> And I was wandering through Church Turks, which who run uh, Chatham Dockyard, and Richard Turks said to me, I want to make this uh, old work boat into a barbecue boat. Hmm. I said, basically, yeah, what you want to do is this. He looked at me and said, do it. And this was a nice. result. Nice. So these are at Kingston. He built five. <laughs> the couple of the stipulations I made was that the uh, decking here is actually reconstituted plastic and not wood. But that, he did reconsider that, but then decided that actually, with it being a barbecue boat, they're going to be pressure washed down more than once a day, possibly, and therefore the plastic will last a lot longer than the timber. And the other stipulation I made was that they're powered by electric outboard. So, no pollution, apart from the barbecue, of course. The barbecue is gas. <coughs> well, they're now doing extremely well at so Kingston. Where are they? Kingston. At Kingston. Yeah. 
Um, and in fact, what will happen is Daisy Green, uh, who's got the Richmond Pier and the new pier, she will operate from she will operate the barbecue boat from the new vessel. And just to prove it, there's a family group on somebody's 70th birthday. So my eldest son, my daughter, and grandchildren. <laughs> just to make sure that um, uh, it works. I do, it, it, it works. works. Do you have to check it out? Yeah. Of course you do. Yeah. So, there we go. Short and sweet. I hope you've enjoyed it. And it's yeah. really yeah, it great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good professional damage insurance. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I do. <laughs> it's like quirky projects. Uh, yes, but most of them are not that expensive, to be honest. The valuations of the big vessels I do with this company in Bovingdon, they carry the professional indemnity insurance. The two professional indemnity companies have agreed that in advance. I made we made sure that that was all done. So yeah, we we, we made sure it was uh, properly done. You said that the um, canvas hadn't burnt. It's PVC, and that's all. That's the only reason it's. It's PVC, and it's made such that it didn't. Um, it, 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 it is fireproof, basically. Mm -hmm. so. When uh, Chris Jackal and I were doing this project, we met three or four times, and you know, we we couldn't really get get to how we were going to do this system. And then the third time we met in a pub somewhere, because he's in Norwich, uh, I'm in <coughs> London, Hemmer Hempstead, so we met in a pub somewhere in between. And uh, I think it was the third time we met, he came along, he brought a model, I brought the drawings, and we said snap. So that was how it all came about. Yeah. Do you know anything about um, the Wellington down the river? The Master Mariners. Uh, the only uh, thing I know about the Wellington is I surveyed the pier about 10 years back. They're not allowed on board anymore, they've just stopped us going on board. Why? Really? Why? Yes. That's the one board went to the Master Mariners. They, they, they should wait on it. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a member of the Master Mariners library and they just sent the thing out saying we're well, no longer allowed on board because it's deemed unsafe. There's a health yeah. and safety, yeah. Yeah. Well, I know yeah. a health and safety yeah. issue and they yeah. shut it down for yeah. some months. Yeah. 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 The thing is that the Wellington itself has not been yeah. surveyed, maintained in my living memory. That could be, yeah. I could be completely wrong, but I don't think it's been done for I've been, 25, right. 30 years. I was there for a function. Mm. I haven't been a member for very long. And there was a car, a, a guy like yourself just came in and put a, a spirit level on the on the floor down yeah. there and watched it for a while and then went away again. That was slightly worried. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to be honest, I was worried by the pier as well. Right. It's a beautiful boat. It would be it such a such yeah. a yeah. It's, it's not it's sound, it's not sound it. crazy when it's never been dry docked in hell. No, yeah. quite. Yeah. The trouble is the nearest place How you can dry dock it? something that size, well tow it, that's not a problem. Mm -hmm. Um it is probably um Dunkirk. Oh, really? Yeah, it's, it's probably the nearest. Because if you think about it, we don't have docks big enough anymore for that size of vessel in the southeast of England. So you know, it's got to be possibly Grimsby or somewhere, or as I say, Dunkirk is probably the nearest. No dry docks in Grimsby anymore. No, no. I did sail. I did take a boat from Yarmouth up to Grimsby a couple of years back. 35 foot motor sailor. Mm, I think there's a, there's a travel hoist, I think, there's another one there now. Yeah, that's mm. But the travel hoist, you know, travel hoist can do anything from five tons up to several thousand tons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah I think yeah, the Goliath cranes in, in, uh, uh, in Belfast, uh, yeah, they could handle a 4,000 ton component. Do you know anything about the Medway Queen and what have we done to the Medway Queen? She's now floating. Well, she's now floating again. She yes. wasn't before. What no. had to be done, I wasn't involved in. Right. I I was asked to get involved at one stage, but they decided against it. So, no, because I saw, saw half-sub in Chatham 
yeah. kind of dockyard decades yeah. ago. Yes. And now I saw it in Ramsgate, uh, mm. looking really quite reasonable. Yeah. yeah. But now I don't know what they've done. <coughs> but yeah, I've have done um, tugs and Vix. The Vix were the uh, steamers up on the Clyde. I've done some work on those and some seagoing tugs and things like that. But usually the steam engines is a bit big on time. Yeah. Um, we touched on issues about um, energy and sustainability in a couple of your projects. Yeah. And I was just wondering if you get involved in um, what a lot of people just generically call plastic boats and your thoughts about them and what's going to happen to them. This is, this is something that our industry is actually talking about very, very seriously. There is one company that does do, uh, if you like, take them and demolish them and convert it into something usable. Uh, there is one company. Europe actually is far, far more advanced than we are, especially the Dutch, um, in terms of recycling old plastic boats. But yes, we are... Uh, looking at it, it does concern us. You know, our, our two major concerns at the moment is lithium ion batteries because of the number of electric boats, but also um, changing battery systems from lead acid through AGMs into lithium ion. And if you've ever seen pictures of lithium ion actually catching fire, they are quite so scary. They don't, they don't go out. No, they mm -hmm. it do, but if your car, if your electric car catches fire, you need to basically stick it in a bath of water, mm -hmm. sink it for three days. Mm -hmm. And that is not an exaggeration. Mm -hmm. We do not have mm -hmm. extinguishers mm -hmm. that are actually of capable of, of yeah. extinguishing lithium ion. Mm -hmm. But they are a concern. Yeah, which is why you get on aeroplanes nowadays that you know if your phone catches fire yeah. tell a member of crew very quickly i don't know what they do with it <laughs> it's not been outside somehow <laughs> it's lost you to step up so Apparently they've done some studies on the uh, river dart and they discovered that the tiny bits of plastic come off all those paddle boards and those boats going up and down. And I think there's another problem in Chichester Harbour, similar. And I just wondered if you had any thoughts on, on that. This might, these are micro Most of the microplastics are actually coming from domestic. Uh, mm -hmm. sources, should we say, rather than boats. You know, plastic boats do not give off microplastics unless they break up and then are broken down. And then more of that will come from the fishing industry rather than from the, the <coughs> industry. But the biggest headache with those is we've all used them, you know, all those micro beads and those cleaners and things like that, and, and you know, toothbrush, uh, um, toothpaste and such like. So, that's where a lot of that is coming from, I believe. I could be wrong. But yes, there are major programs going on in many different countries uh, to absorb and try and control it. Most of it is done by booms. So that they, you, know, you get the flow of water, the boom will catch it, uh, and then you can then take it off and, and dispose of it. But yes, I, I, I think it's a major problem. And yes, I've been concerned for many, many years about such things. And I can remember the last time I paddleboarded. 1962, Little Venice. <laughs> <laughs> it's vaguely on Pathé News at the time for the boat float show, uh, and I'm the little like, there's a very big little blur in the background, but only I would know it was me. But <laughs> yes. Uh, you showed a picture of a uh, houseboat and you mentioned that you were uh, um, specialists in examining the flotation tanks and things. I, 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 I said I was the favourite, yes. Yeah, fiberglass <laughs> and uh, cement uh, yeah. against steel. Can you comment on the length of life of these Well, the best, uh, the best material is concrete, because that will last 100 years quite easily. Um, 
you know, we, we're still using structures that you know, are held together by Roman concrete. Um, the earliest, you know, how old is the earliest ferro cement boat that's still afloat? Any yeah. ideas? Yeah. 1848, it was built. Oh, wow. Pierre Lambeau, uh, who was a Belgian farmer, mm -hmm. uh, built two dinghies out of ferro cement, or what we now call ferro cement. Um, one is still afloat on the Flamingo Pond in the zoo, the other is in a museum. Uh, but they are, one is still afloat after all this time. Are they more popular in Europe than here? Not really, no. Mm -hmm. no. I thought it was more of a French design. No, it was mostly um, more Australians, Antipodeans, uh, French, mm -hmm. sorry, Canada, America, UK. Mm -hmm. South Africa was a big builder of French cement yachts because it was a way of. Um, you could build a nice 40, 50, 60 foot ferro cement yacht, fit it out, yeah. put your money in and sail away. <laughs> you may laugh, but in fact at one point there was, ah, no, if you're going to go more than X miles offshore, you need to deposit the value of that boat in the bank of the day before you No. <laughs> yes, that was what happened. Uh, can I just follow up on the same question? Uh, uh, on, during the slide, uh, the houseboat slide, you mentioned that you were actually working on reconstructing the other one. What would make somebody rebuild their houseboat? I mean, oh, the, the, the house. The house itself? The house basically. itself. Yeah. So to make a nicer house. Yeah. Was it an accident or they just wanted to rebuild it? Just a... they, so the value of they the were, house, were, they, so the value say, of the house built on top of it? Is that they were cheaply built houses in 1984. Okay. They're in a permanently damp atmosphere because they're afloat. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore the outside of those houses had a tendency to decay. <laughs> and they were, <coughs> things, the services were too close to each other. So if you look at the average window sill, which is the easiest way to describe it, you can zoom those who come down that, and then it does that on the other side, so that water drips off. Mm. If you do that, and you get two surfaces like that, and there you get water, it will be sucked into that crack underneath that edge, and decay will spread upwards from there. So a lot of these vessels are decayed, but also in this particular case, I think there was a case they, they wanted to completely change the interior. Um, because the interior makes up part of the construction, they decided it would be cheaper just demolish the house and rebuild it. So it's just, it's it's just, just more. Into more into they built it in wood again. Is it wood? It's, it's wood, plastic, yes. The main frame is wood. Um, but the claddings now are all recycled, mm. the, uh, uh, timber and plastic. So it's a combination of composite materials that they use. And of course the insulation is now in, improved and so on. But the base remains the same. I mean, they've, the still, they've still got the two uh, GRP pontoons that are connected together by steel girders. Although they have got a week coming through which uh, I've now put forward some mm -hmm. ideas to do you have like a maintenance uh, schedule or anything? Uh, regular <laughs> boat has? Or, I mean, do they have to, uh, I mean... No, they have to be surveyed about once every 10 years to satisfy insurance. <laughs> <laughs> but there's only specialist insurers who will take those risks. It doesn't uh, fall into your normal comfort band. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. so you, know, you will get a special... It's like wooden boats. I mean, the group specialists like you. Yeah, uh, that is the other problem. You know, finding the people um, like me, um, and I mentor surveyors if they want me to mentor them. If they, you know, I, uh, I've got one at the moment who's actually a London place oh, surveyor. So sorry. Uh, he said, uh, when you get a decent wooden boat, I want to come and come with you. Okay. Very, very you know, so wooden boats. Sorry, very difficult to find guys with wooden boats. Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. we're all getting old. Is it is it growing in popularity? The households? Um, have you seen any uptick in? The, well, if you look at the Grand Where Union Canal, the number of yeah. floating houses on the Grand Union Canal but here in the M25 has tripled in just over five years. Yeah. Yeah. It's huge. Yeah, you can it's not cheaper than a hotel. Yeah. I mean, well, this is a triple house. They are, no, houses, they are yeah. constantly cruising. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, the problem with permanent houseboats is having the actual site where you're allowed to have a permanent houseboat. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. You know, the actual numbers in London of permanent houseboats technically is 200 ish. <laughs> Seriously, yes. That's where all you can connect the supplies, right? I mean, where yeah, you can what connect them. I'm concerned them. about this, and there are some demands in terms of what they What do they do about their sewage? 
Yeah, that's the 200 places where you could pump the sewage out of it. They, right? they, they, yes, I mean, you, you, they were goes into tanks and then you have to do that. Actually, on mo many houseboats, what we recommend is that you use um, cassette toilets yeah. so that you have a cassette toilet and three or four cassettes. Right. So that even if you get iced in, because if you've got a holding tank, that is the problem during the winter if you get iced in and you can't move it to a pump outside, um, you know, it's a problem. So the, the cassette toilet is, is the one that's used there quite extensively. I see. If you were going to commission an, an unusual project, if you were going to commission it, what you were going to do, what would you do? I haven't got a clue. <laughs> I, 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 no. You sound very reactive. You sound as though people ask you to do things. Yes. But I'm asking you, what if you had the idea of an unusual project? What would you call the that project? What I would do is probably not be unusual. Would it float? Uh, um, would it float? Um, I mean, I, I could sort of combine two of my interests, and therefore I would say, um, you know, you need a nice big catamaran with its own uh, gymnastics. <laughs> apparatus in it. And I'm not talking about um, gym uh, that you see everywhere. Uh, for 30 years I was a gymnastic, boys gymnastic coach. <laughs> uh, so I have an interest in gymnastics as well. Calisthenics? Yeah. Not so much, but yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I think that's a good, yeah. good, good point to finish. We have dinner waiting for us in a moment. So, once again, thank you, Tony, for a really informative and Thank you, thank you for coming. Thank you for those watching online. And uh, come back next week for Pete Newbury's quiz, which should be good fun and a wine tasting. So, thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. That was great.